interesting in working with people over the probably nine years we've been teaching this is that often we do these all this work on great presentations and reports and portals, but we don't name anything. I mean, I've seen so many reports where the titles are something like, you know, regression analysis with XYZ. Who would want to open that up? So, so if nothing else, look at all the presentations and the reports you've done and think about the titles you're using. When the title, the title has to suck people in and frame it for them. And also trailers, you know, trailers for movies, they help you understand what it's going to be about. That's what your abstract or your first page is about, your executive summary. So, so there are some real simple things we can do to help get us down the path of storytelling better than we have, have been. And again, it's all about taking action. So you can present a lot of data, put data in your portals, but if nobody's taking action, what's the point of spending all the money for that data? So you need your audience to be on the same page. You need to frame it. And then also, you, you want to avoid getting distracted. And these words that I have listed here are some of the infamous distractors when you're presenting data, right? Is it statistically significant? By the way, I've used the term now practically significant and been able to avoid um, getting distracted too much. And then the are you sure about? Okay, here's the deal. No, no type of data analysis is perfect. You're never 100% sure, but what you can do is say you're confident in what you're finding. Okay, and then what if you did the blah, blah, blah analysis instead? In most cases, we already probably would have done those analyses, but these are all words to distract an audience so that they don't have to take action. And when you put together your story, you will, you will get less of these distractor sentences and distractor comments from your audience. So what I want to move to next is just giving you a little sense of the steps you can go through to prepare an action-focused data report or presentation. And these are, these are some of the skills that we practice when we're teaching, when we're teaching this topic. And again, you know, I mentioned earlier, learning data-driven storytelling is like um, music and math. You've got to practice it. And practice, practice, practice makes perfect. So, you know, it's something you might or might not be comfortable with, but the more you, the more you try it, the more you have successes with it, the more comfortable you will be. And I have lots of stories about people who've gone through this experience and will we'll say that their relationships with the board of directors has improved, with their senior executives, and with um, anybody that they're working with. So storytelling is impacting the brain, remember, and it's gonna help, it's gonna help in any of the work you're doing. So the three steps. Um, the first one I say is grounding. So what you need to do when you're, when you're embarking on a data analysis slash presentation, uh, data storytelling presentation process, you have to ground yourself in two things. So ground yourself in the context. What's happening in the business? What problem am I trying to solve? You know, why am I going after this data in the first place? Really get your arms around what the context is because that's as important as the data analysis. And then the second thing is really then just ground yourself in the data. So that, you know, make sure you understand the sample, um, pros and cons of the sample, where are the biases in the sample, and then doing some, you know, really preliminary and simple looks at the data. Um, so grounding yourself in the data and the context. And then the second part is creating. Once you have those two together, then start telling the story. Uh, put together alternative stories or al alternative hypotheses and do simple data analysis. And this is one thing that we find really works is before you enter the realm of complex data analysis, make sure you start with the simple data and use that simple data analysis to start thinking about relationships in the data, to think about um, alternative hypotheses. So a lot of times you have one way of thinking about your data, but if you just immerse yourself in the simple analyses, you know, means, simple t-test, you can start thinking about alternatives that, that might make sense. And then lastly, merge together your ideas and your context and your stories and your simple data with your more complex data, and then balance it to come up with your final story that meets the needs of the audience. So just in terms of uh, a little bit more of on these three phases, so grounding yourself in the data. This is where, in this first phase, you just don't want to get into the details. And you know, these are some different techniques that we've used and that others have used to really, arm, if you think about it, it's a, it's a way of doing innovation. Um, if you look at innovation, a lot of innovation work is brainstorming. You're trying to innovate with your data. 
You're trying to really let your mind open up so you're you're analyzing and understanding the data in a nonlinear process. So, you know, um, this view of sticky notes is something I've used, particularly as qualitative data. You can get really lost in qualitative data. You know, I've worked with people where, you know, we're using different um, tools to analyze the data, we're coding it, but you're trying to make it linear. And I think by just putting sticky notes on the wall and, and coming up with, with what you see in the data and then reorganizing them into themes, it can be very powerful and helpful because you're, you're using a nonlinear process. And for those of you who've used mind mapping, mind mapping is really a cool tool. It's a, you know, you can get free mind mapping software and it allows you to, again, take, analyze your data in a nonlinear way and see patterns start to emerge. And then this is a um, storyboard or an evidence board from Breaking Bad. You see this all the time on cop shows, right? There's a reason they do this. They have, they have the board and they have the pictures up there because the pictures help them think through connections that they might not see if they were just looking at tables and charts and looking at things in a linear way. So now the problem with doing this is people think they don't, I mean a lot of individuals I talk to think they don't have the time. And I can tell you this just happened to me when we were working on this qualitative data analysis story. Everybody had their numbers and their, their percentages and I said, I stopped and we just started putting sticky notes up and we were able to come up with a story in the data that we would have not have had if we would have stayed with the analytics and the linear thinking we're doing. So make the time because it can be really helpful. The second phase is creating, and this is where the storyboard really comes into play. So um, a, this is a very simple example of a storyboard. In a typical story, we have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And people, and the reason the middle is there is because that's where all the excitement come from, comes from. Um, if you think about a, an example of a children's story, you know, there's usually the knight in shining armor saves the princess. Um, that would be the beginning and end. Now, if that were only the story, you would be, children would be bored out of their minds and screaming. So the, the way stories get interesting is by, by creating this middle and introducing other characters by really considering the obstacles. So our knight in shining armor has an obstacle, a dragon one has to slay to get the princess. You know, a wall to climb, you name it. But the obstacle and the discussion of the obstacle is what gets people really thinking and engages them emotionally in your story. So at this phase, after you've done your grounding, you want to do the creating. And you want to go on beyond the simple and think about what are the obstacles? What are the contrary hypotheses? You know, you can think about genre here. So when, when I think about genre in telling a data story, think, you know, do I want, do I want, a, do I want to scare people? Do I want, like, is this something about safety? And is this something about our company being able to survive or not? Then, yeah, I want to get high emotion and scare people because they're going to be more likely to take action. Or is it more of just a narrative in a documentary where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice to know, but let's face it, it might be information that doesn't, it's not going to be, ground shattering and so we don't have to have high emotions but th this is the point where you're creating and you're really starting to put your your story together and then the next phase is merging or balancing bringing bringing your instincts and your ideas that you came up with in the first phase um, into the stories and testing out ideas and then run your complex data analysis because now you're ready. Now, once you've thought about the middle, you know what the control variable, variable should be in a more complex analysis. You can come up with a, a model that really represents all of your ideas and puts in, puts, and you're putting on paper maybe what the conditions are, the conditions under which something might be positive or negative or might work or not work. So putting this all together allows you then to come up with the one story you want to tell. And, and there should be one story because, again, you're coming up with the best story, the one story that you know because you're an expert in the data and the context will drive action. Now let me go back to Sherry's example and the work at General Motors and analyze it through those three phases. So. Um, looking back at it, what I would say is they did they did a really um, they did a good job in grounding in terms of they knew the company. So they had people who had been with the organization a long time, you know, understood the context, um, which isn't easy to do in a very large company like that. Um, they analyzed their first wave of data and they saw a problem. Now my sense of it is they saw the problem and they framed it as a problem and they probably didn't go as far as they could coming up with alternatives there, but they. Again, they went through and they saw this was going to be at least something we had to address. So maybe problem's the wrong word. It was an issue. 
And then they created a story from the data. And the first story was that it was going to be a problem. It was, you know, something that, a problem that they had to solve. And then they prepared the, the more sophisticated data analysis and the visualizations and um, told their story. Now, one of the things we realized right away when we met was they did not have a title to their story. So the, re the framing and coming up with a tsunami, um, you know, versus Maverick idea and title really helped them a lot. But I'd say that at first, when they came up with that big insight, they probably didn't spend enough time on the grounding and creating phases because they didn't question the story. And it was bringing in some outsiders to say, you know, maybe this isn't bad for everybody that allowed them to go back to the grounding and creating and say, well, let's, let's not, we believe our data, but let's think about the data in a different way so we can come up with a different storyline. And I'd say that when we met, this was their story. Um, you know, once upon a time, there was a company with a lot of employees. Oh, my gosh, a lot of people are leaving due to succession, and the managers must change and do something. And as we talked and discussed, we added something to it. So we changed this middle. We reviewed the context a little bit and said, you know, it's true. I mean, the company's changing. We're making different kinds of cars. We're we're, our markets are changing globally. Maybe this is an opportunity for us to think about what's the best way to deploy people. Um, how do we think about training differently? How do, we, how do we move, how do we not just think it's a problem, but how do we think about it as an opportunity to move people from areas that might not be the future to areas that will be the future? And it, that, helped, that helped reframe their storyboard and helped reframe their story. So again, adding the context helped them. Um, you know, an aid wave is coming. What are you facing? It's not that they're going, it, that whole framing helped them drive action because people saw choices. Um, not just that it was a problem to be solved, but an opportunity to pursue. So as I think about um, the, all the pieces, again, we, this, is a, this is an hour, we can't go through the whole process. And I gave you a little bit of the tools that we use to help come up with a story. But really, when you go back and you think about data-driven storytelling, there's three phases. So the first phase is getting your data. And I realize that there are many people who feel very challenged by this because they think their data is not accurate or their data is not the best it can be. And you know, the, the one thing I note here is that why do, why do HR professionals get particularly hung up on this? Because you know, data is not perfect in any discipline. I mean, marketing data is not perfect. Finance data is not perfect. I mean, how many times have you had to recast financials? So we get our data. We, we do the best with our data. We understand the pros and cons of it. But it shouldn't stop anybody from helping their organizations if, if you think your data is not perfect. Um, qualitative data, data can be very useful. Get a representative sample of people and, you know, do some short surveys, do some focus groups. There's all sorts of ways to use data and get high quality data in small companies, big companies, companies with databases um, that are sophisticated or not. And even if the data is, you know, a little bit late, um, just you gotta think of the pros, the, uh, the, the risks, you know, the risks that high that you're gonna be that ineffective if you've got two or three people who you forgot to count or the system didn't pick up in turnover, for example. So, so getting your data and remembering the data does not have to be perfect. And then from getting your data, you're focusing the data, and that's where you're finding the story in the data. So, you know, create your story with a subset of the data or a summary of the data, and use different lenses and genres. Um, and again, we talk a lot about genres and how to use genres and what presentations look like with different genres, and then write your script. And then lastly, there's, there's the big part of telling the story, which is, you know, that, that, tells, that takes a lot of practice, too. There's different ways to tell the story. Um, you can do different presentations, technologies, you know, who do you choose to tell your stories, um, and then as you get feedback, you learn from it, and you rework, and you try again. So there's, there's three phases, and, and the learning comes, and the practice comes in all three of those phases. So what we're doing when we learn and teach and practice data-driven storytelling is really playing out this model which has four pieces, data, dialogue, action, and results. And the last two are really important. We want, we want to take our data and tell a story so that people engage in the dialogue. If data without dialogue 
does not drive high quality action. I mean, if you think about experience you've had where you give a manager data and they don't talk to their employees about it, or you give someone data and they don't engage with customers, it's the engaging the dialogue that, that adds the power to drive action because usually more than one person needs to take action. And you can't get measurable business results without action. And if we have a lot of data in our companies that we're just using for scorekeeping, I mean, maybe some scorekeeping is good, but if you're paying millions of dollars for big data systems and software and you're not seeing any measurable results, then someone is going to question why one needs that data at all. So, um, so with that, that's, that's the end of my introduction to data-driven storytelling. It's all about data that drives dialogue, that drives action and results, and again, measurable business results. And just from my own experience in teaching this for, you know, I've said about eight years, um, I've seen people go back and um, our participants go back and use the skills, and we have awesome stories in addition to Sherry's story about how they've used the skills to make differences in their companies, and that's what really matters to me. Um, we're using tools that, from how directors make movies, from the visualization world, and putting them all together in a unique way, and learning as the participants go back in their companies and share with us what they've done. And, and also, this is an area that really is evolving. Um, there's new technologies that we can use. You know, there's a lot more that's happening today and that's being developed. And so it's something that is, I think, uh, you, people are learning from each other and it's going to continue to change. Um, so with that, that's the end of my formal remarks. If you have any questions, we can open it up for questions now. Let's give people just a minute in case they want to type in the chat box. But also, if anyone wants to um, just speak to Teresa on the webinar, feel free to raise your hand so that I know which mm -hmm. line to unmute. Yeah, we do have one question in here. Um, it's basically they're asking how do you identify people who are good at storytelling? And how do you identify people who have the potential to learn? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, in this, I, I have a diagnostic tool that is a little short um, survey and we have people take it who come to the program and it helps them diagnose for themselves the degree to which they are either a data person or a dialogue person. And that's been really helpful. And, and the thing that I like about, about doing that is that um, it's not that one is better than the other. What I do is put people in teams where I get a couple strong data people working with a couple really good dialogue people. And I think it's not, again, everybody has a preference. And you can learn, if you're a data person, you can learn how to be more dialogue oriented. If you're a dialogue person, you can learn more data. But the best results come when you can, you can blend the skills, when people who are good at each can work with each other. So, um, so again, I have a diagnostic tool I'd be happy to share. And then other, there are other ways to do it based on people's experience and, you know, what they're like, what they're good at, how they're successful, um, what kind of, you know, how, you can look at presentations people have done and get some insights there. But, but no matter what, it's, not, it's something that is very, it's something you can learn, it's something you can teach. I mean, if I think about the world, world of academics that I'm in, um, again, there's, there's probably a bias there to do some of the worst presentations you've ever seen in your life because it's really data oriented. But, but the academics have learned that, hey, this, this isn't enough. We can't just throw data at people and expect them to be interested. So they've changed how they do, um, they do their analysis. Also in the medical field, doctors, you know, doctors who are really not good storytellers, and maybe that's, there's some of that's good, um, have had to learn some storytelling skills to help drive action in changing the way nurses um, work in hospitals and, and, and patients. So what we're seeing is in medicine and education and in business, there's a real movement now to try to bring the storytelling skills to people who really don't have them. And you're not going to turn them into the greatest storytellers ever, but they, they can recognize what has to change. Yeah, and somebody else asked, what's the best way to recognize your own strengths and weaknesses? Um, you know, start talking to other people. Get in teams and analyze the data, and I think that you'll see what your contributions are compared to others, and you'll start to get a sense of that. 
So Helene Wilburn has her hand up, so I'm going to I'm unmuting you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, good morning. Um, I was wondering if you're in a scorecard type of environment, okay, you've used this storytelling um, as a means of connecting. How do you keep track of the data so you don't go back to the very same charts that you were running from? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, I always think of those same charts or like a, um, a balanced scorecard as um, preventive maintenance data. So it's not your story, it's your backup. And, you know, there's sometimes when you, you have, like, because people will give me their scorecards and say, where's the story? And honestly, sometimes I'm saying, there's none. It's just there. <laughs> so, you know, there are some cases where it's, like I said, a documentary. And maybe you need to look for additional data. So use that data as the basis, but do some interviews to supplement it. Um, run some additional analyses, but you know, once in a while you'll have some data in your scorecard. But a lot of times it's not, and and, and then some. Then you just need to admit it and not play. You don't want to play the, the good story action hand when you really shouldn't be taking any action. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm processing on two different levels. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I think I'll just say that that is one issue, and I see it particularly with people setting up portals or companies setting up portals. Um, a lot of the data is just not that interesting. So, frankly, I would almost say let's just admit that it's preventive maintenance. Like my best case scenario is to have your portal or your or your benchmark data, and then putting a new like a newspaper front page on top of it. You you might just say what some of the data are, and then supplement it with stories that exempt that are exemplars or or. Of, of the best of what you're seeing in the data, so um, to, to bring it to life. And that's going to take some extra work, again, interviewing people, finding out what departments are doing, but having the stories about what created those that, the scores, what's behind the dashboard can be really useful. Um, I have another question here, unless, Carrie, did anybody else have their hand up? No, not yet. Yeah, we, we really welcome your stories, too. If any of you have done something that you think works in this area, please um, share with us. The one question that's here is how do you shift the audience from wanting interesting stories to actionable stories? Um, gee, I think, you know, in, if you have any where you did have, have actions and measurable results and can present that as an example, it would help. And, and that actually brings up a good point. One of the things that I see in company after company is, it's, there, there are pockets in your companies that are taking action from data and have good measurable results, ROI that they can explain, but nobody writes it down. So, so they don't pass the story on from one to the other. So, you know, again, what you want is examples of not just actionable, of, of actionable stories that led to a result, and then start pitching that and, and using that as an example, and more people will want to be on board. And then when you get them, write them down so that when people quit, the stories don't go with them. In fact, I have one story of um, an individual who helped. She, she was the one person in charge of employee engagement and used her data in a way to help the business. So they started an entirely new business that was very profitable. But when she quit, nobody else knew the story about what she did. So, so they were not benefiting from the really good work the, that she did. And and the good examples, and I see this in company after company after company. And good storytellers, if you take storytelling classes, one of the first things they teach you is write, write down your stories and, and learn to tell that same story over and over again. Any other comments or questions, please feel free to raise your hands if you have anything to share. Yeah, there's one comment here um, that says that there, there, this individual's advice is that um, starting your story with, instead, instead of starting the story with the numbers, figure out what the audience wants to hear that the numbers can address. And I think that goes back to that idea of grounding. What's compelling in the business? Um, what's the strategy? What's the challenge the company is having? And finding the data that addresses that issue, that's, that's perfect. All right, we have 10 more minutes, and if anybody has a question or comment, let us know. Well, if there's no questions, I hope to see you all 
in the data-driven storytelling program in Dallas, and if not there, somewhere else. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Curious or anything else? Nope, I don't see any others. Okay. Thanks, Teresa, for a great webinar. Thanks, and thank you all for, for your interest, and please do stay in touch. And again, if you have questions, let me know, and look forward to learning more from what you all are doing.